actually written a whole book on this. Uh, it's a subject that you can, you'll, you'll be looking at your whole life. Uh, one sermon is not going to cover it, everything, but uh, there's some great truths that we can look at this evening. I'm going to start by reading 1 Peter 1, verses 3 through 11, and then uh, in a little while we're going to go to, uh, uh, to 2 Corinthians. 1 Peter chapter 1, let me start reading in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though... Now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory." receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. We'll just stop reading there. Uh, suffering, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult subject. Uh, verse 11 talks about how, how Jesus suffered. It testified beforehand the, the sufferings of Christ. Uh, Christ came knowing that, uh, that he would suffer. Uh, there's an interesting concept to understand about some of the things that Jesus went through. And one of those is suffering. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2 uh, verse 10 talks about Jesus, the captain of our salvation, being made perfect through sufferings. And when you understand that word perfect as complete... Uh, we understand, you know, God never suffered. But when God became a man, he suffered, the captain of our salvation. And uh, he says, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons unto glory to make their captain, the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. And, uh, you know, in Hebrews chapter 4, how it talks about that uh, when we come to Jesus, our great high priest, uh, he is, has been in all points tempted like as we are. He's gone through the things that we've, we've gone through. Jesus suffered. And Jesus said that we would suffer. In uh, John 16 and, and verse 33, probably a verse that many of you know by heart, these things I've spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Jesus said we would suffer, yeah, so it shouldn't surprise us when we do. Now, I want to give you three things tonight. We're going to look at the causes, very briefly, uh, some of the purposes that God might have in, in mind, and then our, our response. And uh, To me, that's the, the main one that we have a, a say in. The causes of suffering. Well, really, ultimately, the main cause of suffering is sin, isn't it? Um, you know, before Adam and Eve sinned, uh, it's hard to imagine what the world might have been like, but uh, the Bible tells us that before that there was, there was no death and uh, the world was a, was a different place. In uh, Romans, he says, As by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And later on, he, uh, in Romans chapter 8, he says, We know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Uh, the, the things we see, uh, the things that affect us, you know, the fires and the earthquakes and so on, uh, it's, it's a result generally of, of, of sin. Now, we don't always suffer just because of our own personal sin. Uh, when, uh, when you rob my house, the sin is yours, the suffering is mine. <laughs> uh, we suffer sometimes because of others' sin. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different uh, ways that that effect, affects us. Job was a righteous man, and yet he, he suffered. Uh, the blind man in John chapter 9, 
Uh, do you remember that, that fellow? The disciple said, you can kind of just hear their piousness as they, they ask, who hath sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? You know, that's the normal concept, isn't it? If something bad happens to you, God must be getting even with you. Uh, and Jesus' answer was, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Now, he's not talking about in general. He's talking about the specific question they're asking. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He's saying this man's not blind because of some personal sin. He's not blind because of some sin of his parents. Now, he was blind because of sin in general. But he said it wasn't his personal sin. And uh, we, we need to understand that. Now, we do also suffer because of personal sin. Uh, God has a rule. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And in general, the cause of, of suffering is, is sin. But you know, sometimes we suffer just because of our own stupidity. <laughs> Don't we? Uh, you know, we, uh, we do something. Have you ever done something you think, oh, why did I do that? <laughs> and it's too late. You know, you've ruined the car or you've fallen off the cliff or, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, we, we do things that are just pretty dumb sometimes. They're not sin. You know, it's not... Not, not, we're not talking about sin. We're just talking about being careless or, or whatever, and, and we suffer for it. But you know, strangely enough, we also suffer because of salvation. Did you know that? In, in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 14, if you're still there in 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 3, 14 says, But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye. Is that a misprint there? I guess not. <laughs> Happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Sometimes we're going to suffer just because we're Christians, just because of righteousness' sake. And uh, uh, the Bible tells us that very clearly. Uh, probably the, the most well-known verse on this is 2 Timothy 3.12, where it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, whatever the cause, we can know that God has a purpose. And that's, that's an important thing for us to understand. We may not always know God's exact purpose. You know, sometimes we might think we do. And, uh, we're going to read in 2 Corinthians Paul's uh, suffering, and he, he believed he knew what the reason, the purpose God had for, in his, his life. But um, Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and 29 are verses I, I think you should know. You should know off by heart. If nothing else, at least you should know where they are. And he says, and we know, we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Now, that's important for us to understand that, that concept from, from God's word. Uh, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We're the children of God, and God is making us like Jesus. God has a purpose in things, you know, particularly when you can't change something. You know, there's, there's things in life where, yeah, you know, if something happens and you need to pull up your socks and get with it and, you know, whatever. Uh, but there's other times where there's just not a thing you can do about it. And uh, you just need to say, say, well, Lord, thank you, and I'm interested to see how you're going to make good out of this, but, uh, and, and go on. Uh, the cause, well, we may not always know the exact cause, but we know in general it's sin. Uh, the purpose, well, God is doing something good. And uh, I'm going to move through these kind of quickly, but uh, Romans chapter 5, verse, uh, verse 3 there, one of the things he might be doing is teaching us patience. Romans 5, verse 3 says, I'll let you get there. I love that sound. Much better than uh, flicking through, you know, your... <laughs> you, you need to get a sound on there. <laughs> he says, not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. And we were told in Bible college, never pray for patience. Because tribulation worketh patience. Now, you can pray for patience if you want. But sometimes God's purpose in trouble is we need to learn, learn patience. Um, I guess I should have looked at this one first. 1 Peter chapter 5 and, and verse 6. 
Um, God's purpose might be to break our pride. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. I think sometimes when we uh, get proud, God allows some, sometimes things to happen to help us to remember uh, where our strength is. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, this is a, should be a well-known portion of Scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, God tells us that suffering can help us to have sympathy for others. You know, there's no one so sympathetic as someone who's been through that same, that same problem, usually. 2 Peter chapter, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble, by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. Can, can you see the importance there of going to God in your trouble? You need to get that comfort from the Lord so that you can help others when they're going, going through it. Uh, verse 5, For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Uh, I know people who have a ministry because of something they went through. A tribulation, a trouble. Um, it, it's not the kind of, it, it's not the way you want to get into a ministry, but, you know, if we want to serve the Lord, God uses these things for good. Uh, he prepares us to minister to others. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11, uh, a possible purpose could be to strengthen our faith. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 11 I think we might have read this in uh, adult Sunday school this morning. Um, now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. This is particularly talking about the Lord um, chastising us. Uh, but whether it's the Lord chastising us or, or what, what we're going through, uh, it can help us to uh, yield, to, to have that as he calls it here, the, the peaceable fruit of righteousness, uh, to grow in faith. One of the verses, or a couple of the verses we read uh, there in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 6 and 7, he said, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. You know, sometimes we're going through something. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, Though it be tried with fire, it might be found under praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. As we go through things, uh, you know, like we read in, the, in Hebrews there, it's not always a joy to go through, but there's a joy beyond. Uh, God is, is doing something good. Uh, in Psalm 46 and many places in the Old Testament, uh, trouble helps us to remember to depend on the Lord. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will, will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Man, that's trouble. <laughs> though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Uh, God is our refuge and strength. And uh, sometimes we get so dependent on self that we forget, oh, my, my real... Strength is in the Lord. It's not me. It's not my plans. It's His. And uh, sometimes the Lord just has to get our attention. Uh, of course, we know, as we read there in Romans chapter 8, uh, adversity, trouble, is there to make us more like Jesus Christ, whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. And God wants us to be like Jesus. Uh, Philippians chapter 3 and, and verse 10 just looking at these quickly, and I'm sorry if I'm going too quick, but Paul wrote that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be made conformable unto his death uh, to make us like Jesus. Sometimes we go through trouble just for the glory of God. 
Um, I was thinking of, um, some of us saw that film, um, Tortured for Christ, about Richard Wormbrandt. Now, yeah, it wasn't, as far as I know, it wasn't because of personal sin, but God used that for his glory you know, in his life, uh, in, in, the, in the ministry. He had a ministry to those other prisoners, and God used it for, for glory. You know, sometimes trouble gives us an opportunity to serve. Think of the Apostle Paul, you know, being chained to those soldiers. He had a, a captive audience, and he, he, could, he could witness to them. And he talks about people in the palace who'd gotten saved. And it was because of the trouble he went through. Uh, John 11 and verse 4 is, is the verse I'm thinking of here when uh, Jesus was talking about Lazarus. Uh, you know, they, they said... Um, this sickness, he said, I'm sorry, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God. Interesting. Uh, suffering sometimes is just for the glory of God. And sometimes it's just to get us to examine ourselves. I, I don't know. I think most of us at some time in our life, uh, as you go through trouble, you think, now, is this because I'm not right with God? Is God uh, doing this so that I'll uh, stop my sinning? And uh, sometimes that's exactly the truth. Sometimes we're get, having trouble because of our sin. But, and God can use it for, for good in our life. Mark 4, verse 19, is the, uh, the parable of the sower. And he said, The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things, entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Sometimes that's where we are in our Christian life. Sin has, you know, we've gotten careless and callous to the things of God. and God can use the, the trouble to... Help us to stop and think, uh, where am I? Uh, whatever the cause, uh, you know, it's impossible for me to give you a complete list here, and I'm not trying to. Um, I guess, in a sense, when you think of God's purpose, think of a doctor. You know, sometimes your doctor will hurt you. <laughs> I broke my arm once, and you know that the doctor grabbed my arm and, and wiggled it around. <laughs> yeah, it, it hurt. And sometimes God will use trouble to help us. Uh, but whatever the cause, whatever the purpose, personally, I think our main, our main uh, focus needs to be on our response. Uh, we can't always control the cause, or the, we certainly don't control God's purpose. But how we respond makes all the difference. I came across a story some, some time ago. It's a true story. A, a man went to talk to a, a fellow on, on, the, on a farm, and he was talking to him about his grief and about his sorrow. And the man said, come out here, let me show you something. And he showed him this big field. He said, when I bought this property, th this field wasn't fenced, but somebody had planted maple trees all around it. And he said, I used those maple trees for posts. And I took barbed wire and I took nails and I drove those nails, uh, you know those nails like that that you put in there, uh, into those maple trees. And he said, I want to show you something. And he showed him one tree. It had been some years ago that he'd done that. And here was a tree, and basically it had a barbed wire going right through the middle of it. That tree had just grown around it. He said, let me show you another one. Took him over to another tree, and here was a tree that was all distorted and warped. And you know, that, that barbed wire, it, it, had just, it hadn't adapted very well at all. And he said, you know, that's, that's like a lot of people. Some people, trouble, they respond in such a way that it just destroys their life. He said, other people just accept it and go on. They look, look to God. Now, that's just, a, just an illustration, but... It's true. How we respond makes such a difference. You know, I, I meet people all the time who really, in, a, in effect, are shaking their fist in God's face. Sometimes at a, at a young age, they'd ask God for something, and, and God had not answered their prayer. And now they just don't want to believe in a God who wouldn't answer their prayer. You know, you've heard different ones, and it, it's true. And you know, especially as Christians, uh, adversity is not what controls our joy of life. Adversity, you know, trouble is not what's in control of the joy of our life. It's how we respond. And as Christians, we have the Holy Spirit. Uh, listen, no matter what our situation, the fruit of the Spirit is available. I remember one uh, preacher saying to people in a war-torn country, 
He said the fruit of the Spirit is available here just like it is in other parts of the world. And it's true. How we respond. You know, what we usually do is we, we want to establish blame. Boy, you see that in the news all the time, don't you? You know, people blaming people. You, parents really cop it there. <laughs> Poor parents. Yeah, we're, all, we're always to blame. Uh, usually it's someone else. Very few people will, will take responsibility. A and it ends up just with misery and, and bitterness. Sometimes they, they, they work real hard to try and remove the pain, even to drugs and, and so on. And there's, no, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be rid of pain. But uh, their main concern often is just themselves. Uh, God says in Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And we need to believe it when God says that, these, that he has a good purpose. And he has eternity in mind. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want to focus mainly tonight on uh, our response to, to trouble and suffering. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You're probably aware, Paul had, as the Bible calls it here, a thorn in the flesh. People debate about exactly what it was. They think it was probably a vision problem. And quite often he talked about how he's written with such a large hand or he had people writing for him and so on. And uh, he, he indicates even that it, it made him look odd. You know, something was going on with, with his eyes. But in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 and uh, verse 6, Though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. I'll just stop reading there. Uh, suffering. It's common to all of us. And... One of the things we need to do, like Paul did, is when we're in trouble, we should pray. Paul wasn't wrong to ask the Lord to help him with that, and God gave him an answer. Uh, he showed him his purpose. Uh, I think it was, was, was several. Uh, Jesus, in uh, Luke chapter 18, had a parable, and it was basically that man ought always to pray and not to faint. Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. And we need to realize... The main battle in life is a spiritual battle. We talked about it this, this morning. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. You know, when you're having a, per a problem with a person, it's not just that person. It's the spirit of the, of the, th of the person. It's a spiritual battle. Um, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, just go back a, a little ways there. The Bible says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. It's a spiritual battle and it's not physical things that are going to win the battle. It's spiritual things. Uh, so number one, we pray. As well, we can look for the lesson that God is teaching us. Now, I, I see a couple of things that Paul uh, learned from his thorn in the flesh. One, he, he talks about in verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure. God was helping him not to be proud. God, God used Paul in amazing ways. Now, he did things that just hardly anybody else had ever done. And uh, God allowed, uh, the Bible calls it, uh, a messenger of Satan. But as well, in verse 9, 
He says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God's purpose was that he would not work in his own power, but see God's power even more. You know, we tend to get in the way. You ever been doing a job and somebody trying to help you and they, they get in the way? Uh, a lot of us, we're that, that way with God, you know. God wants to do something. He wants to use us. And we, oh, you know, we're, we're flailing around. And uh, I remember riding a motorcycle with my brother. I was a, I was a kid, and he was, he was, he was a lot older than me. And, uh, you know, he'd, he'd go around the corner, and, man, I'd lean the wrong way. And he, he stopped me and said, listen, you've got to go with me on this. <laughs> you've got to lean with me. And uh, that's the way it is with the Lord, you know. Uh, we got, we've got to lean with him. And uh, sometimes it's, it's pretty scary when we do. We need to look for the lesson that God is, is teaching us. Satan is determined to harm us. Listen, Satan never has a good motive in, in wh what he, whatever he's involved in our life. And uh, I think sometimes we give him more credit than, than we need to. Uh, you know, we often talk about Satan doing this and Satan doing that when a lot of times it's just us not, uh, not doing what we should. But God's work is always for our good. And, and God is greater. Greater is he that's in you than, than he that's in the world. But whether we see God's purpose or God's lesson, we can still trust Him. You know, sometimes you'll be going through something and you just won't see you know, what God's purpose is because you're not there yet. Um, Joseph in the Old Testament, to, to me, he is, he is the ultimate example of this. Remember him? His brothers sold him. <laughs> That's just hard to imagine. You know, kind of you know, talk about a dysfunctional family. Uh, and then as a slave, uh, he is wrongly accused and imprisoned. You, you know, I'm, I'm sure he was just saying, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, it's just hard to imagine uh, the things he was going through. And yet, as you read the end of the story, from prison, he becomes prime minister of the most powerful nation in the world at that time. It just, un well... Not unbelievable, but you know, if, if we didn't know our God, it would be. And his comment, you know, when, when their dad dies and his brothers are uh, appearing before him, and they're worried, boy, Joseph is going to get even with us now. <laughs> and his comment at the end of Genesis, uh, he says, am I in the place of God? Yeah, he's not going to get revenge. He said, as for you, ye thought evil against me. He didn't excuse what they'd done. He didn't say, hey, it's all right. I said, you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now, I, I don't know. What would have happened if Joseph had gotten bitter and twisted and not, not believed the Lord, not trusted the Lord? Uh, we don't have to worry about that. He, he didn't. But we need to understand, whether we see God's purpose, whether we see God's plan, um, uh, we can trust him. Someone wrote a, a song, all things work for our good, though sometimes we don't see how they could. Struggles that break our hearts in two sometimes blind us to the truth. Our Father knows what's best for us. His ways are not our own, so when your pathway grows dim and you just don't see Him, remember you're not alone. God's too wise to be mistaken. God is too good to be unkind. So when you don't understand, when you don't see His plan, when you can't trace his hand, trust his heart. I think that's a great message. You know, when you don't see what's going on, when you don't understand it, just know you can trust the heart of God. God knows. God cares. He's, uh, he's too wise to be mistaken. He's too good to be unkind. Um, eternity. Eternity. We should uh, look, uh, we should rejoice at God's working in our life. Now, I know that's hard. You know, I read those things, and I'm just like you. You know, when you're going through trouble, rejoice. You know? Man, that, that just seems so contrary, doesn't it? And yet, if we, see what, if we could see what God is doing, I believe we would. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, um, the end of verse 9, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Uh, doesn't that sound strange? I take pleasure in infirmities. Uh, just uh, rejoicing that God is willing to work in, in our life through these things. He is Lord. Uh, the teachers that he uses, we may not like the teachers. 
Verse 10 there, I take pleasure in infirmities. That word means weakness, lack of strength. I don't think any of us particularly like being weak or lacking the strength to do what we, we want to do. And yet God oftentimes will use that as a teacher. The next one he says there is in reproaches. Reproaches are insolence, insult, injury. Jesus experienced that, didn't he? Now, there's people who will insult you. And uh, you, know, you can respond in the flesh or you can say, well, here's a teacher from the Lord. Rejoice. <laughs> uh, I find that quite often you'll have a natural response and you need to get past that to the supernatural. Uh, be careful and be calm. The, the third teacher is in necessities. Inward and outward pressures. You know, as an adult, sometimes you just, the necessities of life wear you down. You know, the things you've got to do. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. And yet God can use that as, as a teacher. In persecutions, we understand that word. The word in Scripture actually has to do with someone trying to drive you away. Someone, you know, in history, there's been Christians who've been driven out of town. Even in places like England where no one would let them settle down. And some of them would die because they, they had no place to sleep, they couldn't get food, and so on. You want to talk about persecutions. Uh, and then he says that another teacher is in distresses for Christ's sake. That word distresses means narrowness of place, uh, anguish. You know, there's, just, there's just sometimes in life when, when life just seems to, uh, to weigh you down, the, the distresses of life. And yet God says... Uh, we can take pleasure that God has a purpose. God has a plan. That sounds hard, doesn't it? A uh, little poem I, I learned some time ago. I've probably said it many times. I walked a mile with pleasure. He chattered all the way. Left me none the wiser for all he had to say. I walked a mile with sorrow. Not a word, said he. But, oh, the things I learned when sorrow walked with me. God has a purpose, and it's not always going to be uh, in pleasant places. Uh, sometimes we're going to go through the valley of the shadow of death. Uh, sometimes it's going to be difficult. God uses all kinds of different teachers. Now, don't forget, the joy of the Lord is my strength. And his power is shown here in, in 2 Corinthians 12, the end of, of verse 9 again, uh, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We're looking for the power of Christ. The end of verse 10. For when I am weak, then am I strong. You have the strength of God. Um, Galatians 2.20, you probably know. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And that's what we're talking about here. Our response. You know, we sing the song, Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. Help me stand. I'm weak. I'm tired. I'm worn. Boy, that's life, isn't it? And that's when we say, Lord, I just got to rest on you. Uh, we should not live for Christ in our own efforts, but realize that Christ lives in us through the power of his Holy Spirit. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. I don't think we can talk about suffering and not, not read at least part of Romans chapter 8. Uh, we want to see God's power working in us. We want to see God's power working through us. Now, Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, you know, what a blessing. What a blessing. People are going to suffer whether they're saved or not. Have you realized that? Yeah, even, even the uh, rich and famous suffer. Um, people are going to suffer whether they're saved or not. 
But the difference is, without God, it has no purpose unless it points, points them to Christ. If they see their helplessness and, and cry out to God uh, to save them. Uh, when we started there in, in 1 Peter, he talked about our lively hope. You know, as Christians, we have a lively hope. You know, the world goes through the, much of the same suffering we do, but without that lively hope. And uh, uh, this relationship that we want starts with salvation. In Romans chapter 1, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. You know, the gospel is what's given us life in Christ. Christ's death for our sins. Christ's burial with our sins. Christ's resurrection, you know, giving us new life. What a blessing. You know, our sins condemn us, but Christ died for our sins. And he offers us forgiveness and life. And he says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I just happened to flick the TV on today, and, and they were talking about people going to confession. And it just made me feel so sorry for them. Thinking that they can go to a person and, and the little, there was a little girl saying, oh, I just feel so much better when I've told them. And then she has to do it the next week. And she has to do it the next week. And do it the next week. Listen, that's not the salvation we have in Christ. He died for all of our sins. They're all under the blood. And uh, we can have peace with him. And we can have peace as we uh, go through the trials of life. Heaven is our home. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Um, I don't think we sang this, this song earlier, but I thought we'd end with page 293. No one understands like Jesus. If we did sing it, we'll sing it again. Okay, page 293. Let's just sing the, the first and the last verse. And